James Tarnas, thank you very much for joining us today. Can we start by uh, just telling us a bit about your role in Bougainville in the last few years? Uh, so thank you, Jonathan. My role has been just basically, basically two major roles that I played during the Bougainville conflict and during, during the Bougainville peace process. During the conflict, I was part of the Bougainville Revolutionary Army that took up arms against the government of Papuini, against the mining company. Uh, and then during the peace process, I was basically a peace builder. Uh, th those were the two right. main things uh, that my role involved. But let me go back a little bit to 1988. I was a st young student when the conflict started because I come from the district where the conflict started. Right. I was unable to go to school. I stayed back in the village. So I stayed all my entire life in, in the district that I come from, took mm. part in it, and I've never left uh, Bougainville s since then. Uh, also to say that I never completed my school, so right. I was, I'm just basically a village boy from that area mm. who took active participation in the fighting and in the peace building. Mm. And I continue to be a peace builder today. Right. Yeah. And back when you were a student prior to the conflict, you, you never dreamed you would one day be president? I never dreamed that one day I will be the president. In fact, I hated politics so much that I decided not to take social sciences in school. Right. I was just majoring in mathematics science and strangely I was studying Japanese language. So right. I, and in the end I end, ended up uh, studying to be an accountant, thinking that I would take up a profession where I can spend some quiet time behind the doors just playing around with figures mm. and balancing the books. Mm. So and what was not the what was the sequence of events that led you to become president? Uh, because I come from the area and I got myself involved in the early days. I was sort of lucky because in the early days of uh, the militancy and the insurgency, mm. uh, there were n not many young men that were recruited into the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. But because I come from the district, the Panguna district, where the prob uh, problem started from, I naturally just uh, entered into the Bougainville Revolutionary Army and I was one of the few educated ones, just not high level of education, but just enough right. level of education to, to at least carry a weapon, but at the same time carry a pen and a paper. Right. Uh, that was the main distinction from uh, about me and the other combatants that I was fighting alongside with. Right. Yeah, so uh, what I would say is that because of that background, it gave me an extra leverage to associate myself to the fighting men as a young man, mm. but also listen to the older people, the older leaders under which we were fighting, to listen to them. And because of that, uh, that education background, background I had, uh, Francis Honor, the Supreme Commander, sorry, the Supreme Commander got me uh, to work for him. Right. So basically I was fight, doing a bit of fighting, here and there, and a bit of attending meetings, listening to the political leaders, writing and mm. taking notes for them. Right. So, uh, so I grew up and I I in that environment as a young man, uh, took part in fighting, and by the same time I was beginning to take more uh, political responsibilities. In 1990, the government of Papua New Guinea pulled out, and in, in the first ceasefire in 1990, left a big vacuum, and Bougainville was thrown into a turmoil. Yes. Because of the way the conflict started, the mm. Bougainville Revolutionary Army was not a conventional army. It mm. was almost a, an army of the villages. So we, we yeah. came from all walks of life. Mm. Some were politicians, some were businessmen, some were religious people, some were students like me. And of course, a good number of them were, were people from the cl criminal elements. So when the state right. functions went through, the criminal, criminal elements started coming up. Yes. And they overpowered the political masters and mm. Bougainville was thrown into a period of chaos and violence mm. and, and anarchy. And that was a time when a certain part of the population started thinking, okay, th th this is not safe. Mm. Maybe we, are, we will be better off with the government of Papua New Guinea. So they started linking and communicating and contacting the Papua New Guinea Defense Force so for the return of the Papua New Guinea authorities back on the island. Right. And of course, because of the difference of opinion on the politics, uh, Bougainville was divided, and then one part of Bougainville was still at the Bougainville Revolutionary Army, and the other part of the Bo uh, Bougainville uh, under a militia that was sponsored by the government of Papua New Guinea and by the Papua New Guinea government, mm -hmm. with weapons uh, given by Australia under the defense, uh, Australian defense Papua New Guinea ties. Right. Yes, so mm -hmm. Bougainville was uh, then 
basically divided in half. Mm -hmm. We continued, uh, continued fighting amongst ourselves and the conflict was becoming complicated. Yes. Mm, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, the Bougainville conflict started uh, developing multiple layers. Mm. The, it mm. started from, from a frustration against the mining company, and when the state mishandled the situation, the Bougainvilleans retaliated against the state, meaning Papua New Guinea, and when, when the state withdrew, uh, there was a vacuum, and right. part of Bougainvilleans retaliated against the uh, Bougainville Revolutionary Army, so Bougainville was also divided. Right. So it went into a multiple layer of conflict. Yes. And we continued that way. There was a stalemate. We could not move any further. Mm. Uh, public the government nor the Bougainville side to, um, uh, would uh, do any progress forward. Mm. But when that was happening, uh, the, the victims were the civil society. People were suffering. Yes. So there, there had to be a way out. Mm. And mm. the way out was first attempted by the government of Papua New Guinea when they hired uh, a missionary, uh, South African-based missionaries that was called executive outcomes. Right. Uh, outcomes that was not very well received by the military in Papua New Guinea. Mm. For, for the government of Papua New Guinea to hire a missionary company outside of Papua New Guinea was seen as a vote of no confidence against their own state institution. Sure. So the mm. Papua New Guinea Defense Force it revolted against uh, the government of Papua New Guinea, a bit of mm. problems in Mosby, the Prime Minister resigned. Mm. But when that was happening, it gave one thing to the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. It gave an immediate sympathy in Papua New Guinea, sympathy yes. on Bougainville, and also sympathy abroad. Right. And that brought in uh, a big amount of international attention. Mm. And uh, that uh, also sent a powerful message to Bougainvilleans that a time has come for us to reunite. Mm. And mm. also, as I, was, I mentioned in my presentation earlier, was that there was now a thinking in the Bougainville Revolutionary Army leadership that the guerrilla warfare tactics were now failing. Mm. Uh, we had to move to a higher level. Right. Uh, meaning the higher level was now of a diplomacy, negotiations, and uh, peace and dialogue and reconciliations. Right. And of course, what was clear in our minds was that the, uh, the weapons we were holding were no longer going to play a major role. Mm. Our major mm. weapon would be international credibility mm. and friendship, trust and respect. Mm. Uh, and they will be more of the important tools that we will be needing for peace building. But during the process that I just mentioned, yes. I, from a student I became a fighter. Then from a fighter I was also playing more of a clerical and administrative roles within the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. And then around 1993, uh, 1993, yeah, 1993, I resigned mm. from the Bougainville Revolutionary Army and just decided to stay in the village. Mm. And then I re-entered the Bougainville Revolutionary Army with a very totally different function that I thought I would never do also. Mm. That was to do, work with the chiefs uh, in the village and and take more active responsibilities in political political awareness and political education. Right. What we noticed then was that, look, to us, what is independence? Mm. We call this word independence, and not many people knew what independence was. Mm. So what we did was we formed a small group, uh, a group of a discussion group where we would just we would sit down, criticize ourselves, criticize our leaders, and just to think uh, if we are on the right track. Right. But out of that discussion group, what we came up with is a political education program mm. that, give, that started giving out a basic political awareness mm. on what independence is mm. and what state building is, what peace mm. is, and what we can do and what we cannot do. And of course, an important part of it was to recognize our own limitation. Mm. Our own limitation was the first one, we were aware that the international community, there was no third nation sponsoring Bougainville independence and sponsoring uh, the Bougainville Revolutionary, uh, Revolutionary Army. We right. were alone on an isolated island. Right. So we had to think. And second, the international community continued changing. Mm. And if we continue to drag on, we will lose support. And of course, our people were changing. Mm. Uh, in the end, we will, we, we will lose people. And also, most of our commanders were getting killed. Mm. And also, as I mentioned in my presentation earlier, two things that 
characterize Bougainville warfare is the ability to start it and the ability to end it. Right. And traditionally, even from our, the days of our grandfathers, if you start a war, you must make sure you end it within your time mm -hmm. so that you do not lose the objectives of the, of the conflict. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we started, we formed that group. I designed a small political education program. We conducted it in the villages with the fighting men, with the chiefs. And quickly, uh, I mean slowly, it got recognition mm -hmm. from, from the leaders of the struggle. So I was asked then to join the political leadership. Right. And then I was appointed a minister for peace even I, I think two years before the start of the formal peace process. Right. So what it gave us was that even in the Bougainville Revolutionary Army, even during the days of fighting, there was already a small core unit mm. in the Bougainville Revolutionary Army that was thinking peace, and that was, uh, that was thinking peace, discussing peace, so that we already had a grassroots initiative going. In fact, some of the reconciliations that we had actually started before the signing of, of the formal uh, peace process right. uh, with mm. the Arab Bougainville factions and also with the government of Papua New Guinea mm. and of course mm. long, uh, before the, long before the arrival of the neutral peace monitoring mm. groups mm. and the United Nations observer mission. Right. So w the most important thing maybe that I would leave in this seminar mm. is to say that peace can be adv advocated Peace can be attempted to be enforced, but peace really starts with those who, who hold on. Uh, peace actually will hold on until those who, who are in, uh, in the center of the fighting decide to accept peace. Right. Yes, a lot of Bougainvillean, few, in fact, few Bougainvillean leaders lost their lives. Few civilians lost their lives in their attempts, attempts for peace. Mm. Uh, mm. So, but the, the difference with this uh, peace process at the moment, the current peace process, is that the peace process now is held on because it is based on a decision that was made by the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. Right. Mm. So you it's not it's not that because we have a magic uh, magic formula mm. or that. Mm. It's simply because of the fact that we were the ones that were doing the fighting, mm. and we were mm. the ones we had to accept peace and leave peace. You mentioned that. that at the height of the conflict, there were sort of multiple layers. Mm. I, I guess you reach a point where, where some of the objectives start to get a bit lost. Yeah, the, so the objectives started getting lost uh, right after 1990. Right. Mm, because the main two objectives were uh, based on the grievance against the mining company. Mm. And then from that it evolved into a long-standing issue over the question of Bougainville, the independence away from Papua New Guinea. Right. But then it was getting lost into mm into just pure hatred mm. and also certain groups for abusing that vacuum mm. the situation to s score their own, uh, to settle their own scores yes so there was some personalized conflicts right so and we were beginning to lose it and, and i and must uh, say that we yeah, we are actually lucky yeah that we had to end the conflict before the two original agendas were mm. or, uh, were lost and and uh so just summarizing one of your points there, the turning point really came when the focus went from conflict to mm. dialogue about what everyone wanted to achieve. Yes, right. Yes, the turning mm. point came when those of us who were in the centre of the fighting realised that fighting was no longer, fighting would not achieve anything. Right. We had to move on, we had to adapt. Right. Mm. So, um, so tell me about your involvement in the, in the peacekeeping process now. Now, what, what drives you to continue after so many years of, I guess, living with conflict and having been involved mm. in, the, in the process of resolving yeah. that? I'll, I'll go back to the time when I was, um, I was the Minister for Peace. Mm. Within the Bougainville Revolutionary Army, I started uh, working as a Minister for Peace when the peace monitoring group uh, started coming in. Mm. Naturally, I was the main person within right. the Bougainville Revolutionary Army that started linking. and started connecting at a grassroots level yes. to, to now change into the new situation. Yes. But before that, because we were in a, in, in a blo blockage situation, mm. we could not get much information from the outside. Mm. But, and one day while in the bush, we got a book. <laughs> the, the book was written by Nelson Mandela, 
long walk to freedom. Right. And one of the important statements he made was you cannot make peace by talking to your friends, but you have to make peace by talking to your enemies. Right. And during the presentation, I mentioned that we had a difficult time trying to adjust to the Australian participation because of mm. the colonial history and the mining history yes. we had. To us, Australia was the enemy. Mm. Uh, but, but we had to find a way out. Mm. Yes. We, we tried our best to find another nation to uh, support the peace process, yes. uh, but we could not find any nation that could mm. beat the Australian contribution. Mm. Australia, Australia was contributing big money, in term, uh, big time in terms of finance, human resource, and also logistics. Yes. So we had to, mm. we had to find a way out. Mm. And the way out for us was to put a United Nations observer mission so that those who still continue to have problems with Australian participation at least will link through the United Nations. Yes. Uh, but there's something else that I will, I will mention uh, in, in this interview that I did not mention at the seminar. Sure. Mm, one of the things that we found a little bit difficult with the, with, with the peace monitoring group mm. was the humanitarian, humanitarian aspect of it. Right. The way the peace monitoring group was deployed on Bougainville, the, the, their mandate was not humanitarian assistance. Their right. mandate was monitoring the peace, and mm. that's it. Mm. But there were times when we would find out, find, uh, end up in a situation we would have wanted them, wanted a bit more from them in terms of assistance. Yes. Uh, but we could not ask them any, anything more than that. Right. And in a Bougainville society. Uh, what we believe in is this. Sharing is caring, mm. caring is respect, mm. and respect strengthens peace. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you two examples. There, were, uh, there was an Australian peace monitoring site, and this site was right in, right, it, I think it was a center that was most closest to Panguna. And the standing order at the camp or their policy was, if there's food, this leftover, bury it. Don't give it to the locals. Mm. So one day they had a big leftover of meat. So under their regulations, they could have buried it. Mm. But one of the commanders, who was, and the commander was assigned to that camp, decided, no, we are going to waste this. We give it to the locals. Right. So he gave, it, gave the meat to us. We distributed the meat but some of the meat from the peace monitoring group, we ended it out to the ones that were still resisting the peace process hold up in the mountains. Right. They received that meat, they distributed that meat amongst themselves. Mm, mm. And a week later, a line of commanders came down mm. and asked me if they could talk to the peace monitoring group. Mm. And that's how they joined the peace process. Mm. Yes, so that is one, uh, one example of uh, mm of a situation where I, I noticed that mm. maybe if there was a humanitarian uh, site attached to this peace operation, right. it would help. Because remember, I talked about the multiple layers, mm. the deployment of the Australian forces on, on Bougainville in the peace monitoring group mm. was actually, in my view, was supposed to have provided two functions. Yes. One is to, to facilitate a neutral environment for us, the Bougainville factions, yes. and also a relationship building between the Bougainville, Bougainvilleans and the Australians. Right. Mm. Mm. But let me say that, let, let me say that uh, even though uh, the humanitarian side of the peace mission was not their mandate, they did very well. So this mm. peace operation on Bougainville also helped to improve relationships mm. uh, with the Australian, uh, Australians on Bougainville. In right. fact, it was only about three months ago. I did one major peace activity. In Bougainville, there was, uh, there's a, the location around Panguna was a no-go zone to the Australians during, during the peace operation. Right. In fact, no peace monitor entered Panguna during that time. Mm. It was only about three months ago when I first time, for the first time, arranged a reconciliation between the Australian High Commissioner to Papua New Guinea, Ian Kemis, right. and the faction that refused to talk to the Australians. And this ceremony involved, uh, involved a very simple thing, not big money, just one live pig with a bag of rice, 
and we perform a cultural ritual to allow the Australian High Commissioner for the first time after 23 years for any Australian official mm. to enter into Panguna. Mm. So what I'm trying to <laughs> get at, uh, Jonathan, is this. Mm. Peace building on Bougainville is largely based on relationship building. Yes. Uh, relationship building, because through relationship building, you then improve perspectives, and then you, you improve perceptions. If there's a negative perception, then you improve it through relationship. Yes. And in a Melanesian society like Bougainville, you, uh, the way you, <laughs> the way we build a relationship is not in formal meetings. Mm. Mm. It might take you just an offer of a cigarette. Mm. Offer your cigarette lighter to a, fr to a stranger, you've made one friend. Mm. Offer mm. food, you, may, you make a friend. Mm. In fact, there were times, Jonathan, when I wondered what could have happened if the, if the policies and the regulations allowed the Australian army commanders and their civilian monitors to chew betel nut. <laughs> right. <laughs> because betel nut, we use betel nut mm. in peace building. Yes. We, we use betel nut in gatherings mm. and, to, and to make friendship. Mm. 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 And we use betel nut to court women too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm not sure how, they, how well that would work in Australia. But, well, uh, no. <laughs> but, I, but I, I, uh, you yeah, made a very I, I know it's a difficult thing. Uh, they would not allow it, but no. I'm just but trying you, to make a point. But the point you're making is that understanding local customs, local traditions, understanding local people and the way they communicate is a really important part of the peace process because mm. if you can't build the relationships, yeah. then give, you can't have dialogue. I'll give you another example. The Fijians, uh, the regulations did not allow Fijians and Nivans to bring in cover. But right. few few of them sneaked in, and uh, right. the kava plant, uh, the yangona plant where kava is made from, mm. actually grows wild on Bougainville. Too mm. much of them. Mm. It's just that we Bougainvilleans we, we don't use it. Right. So they did uh, use some, sneaked in some, used that opportunity to build mm. relationships. Mm. Mm. So, right. Because the official mandate of the peace monitoring group did not have a humanitarian assistance where sharing can be mm. part of the program. Mm. Uh, yeah, a few people broke rules to build relationships mm. and it worked for the peace process. And it sounds like it, 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 it's a lesson learned for the future mm -hmm. in similar situations. Yes. James Tarnas, thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure.